But let's let's jump in with this. Just briefly, who is Molina? Mm. What is Molinism? Right. Well, uh, I'll just preface that <laughs> with this. Probably, you know, around 500 years or so, when it comes to the issue of how how to view God's sovereignty, it uh, seems that <coughs> Christians and those behind the walls of the church have really been given only two answers uh, from which to choose. You can either be a Calvinist or you can be an Arminian. Now, you know, as I was growing up and getting into theology and becoming a pastor, uh, that was the case. Those two options were given to me. And it was like that for, uh, you know, up through probably my mid thirties, I only real I only thought that I had those two options, but neither of those options uh, satisfied me. Um, I did, however, say, well, between the two, I think Calvinism makes the the most sense, and so I devoted my life to it. Actually, I was a committed what some would call a, a, a cage stage Calvinist. <laughs> I mean, it didn't really satisfy me, but I was like, this has got to be true. It makes the most sense of the biblical data. And if the, this is God's word, I'm, I'm all in. And so, I mean, I would fight with people over this uh, for years, but it wasn't just me though. Not, I don't think either option often satisfies people who strive to take their theology, let alone the entire Bible, seriously. And that's the, the reason why is because Calvinism, I'll just be honest, let me sing its praises for a second. It makes sense of a whole bunch of scripture, but just didn't seem to make sense of all scripture. But Arminianism also had the same problem. It made sense of a lot of scripture. In fact, it kind of made sense of the passages that Calvinism couldn't make sense of, but then it would fail to make sense of all scripture. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and the Calvinist could say, well, I can make sense of where Arminianism fails. So here's the deal. Calvinism is often reduced to what I said earlier, exhaustive divine determinism. I call that ed, E-D-D. So exhaustive divine determinism or ed, that's a view that God exhaustively causes and determines in one way or another, all things that happen. And if all things really means all things, then this would include all the thoughts. Now think about that. All of your thoughts, your actions, all of your beliefs and all of your behaviors right. of all people all the time. So that means that God causes and determines all things thoughts, actions, beliefs, and behaviors of all people all the time. And this leads many to conclude that if Calvinism is true and, and connected to Ed, then God is ultimately the author of evil and the one who forces the majority of humanity to suffer in the eternal fires of hell for all eternity. So that doesn't seem uh, like the omnibenevolent God who, according to 1 John 4, 8, is love. And, you know, Jesus claimed to represent this God of love. It doesn't seem to make sense of, uh, you know, the God that desires all people to be saved that Paul discusses in uh, 1 Timothy 2.4. Uh, it doesn't make sense of the God that desires no one to perish, according to 2 Peter 3.9, or the God uh, who so loved the world that whosoever, right, in, in John 3.16, I mean, it just doesn't really seem to make sense of all these passages. And, there, and there's many more, both Old Testament and New Testament. Now, the, this leads many to choose the second option or the other option that were uh, offered, which is uh, really known as the simple foreknowledge view. It's often associated with uh, the label Arminianism. Hmm. Maybe that's incorrect, but that's just how uh, how it was presented to me. And that's, I think, how most people... Uh, think of it today. Yeah. So uh, it's the simple foreknowledge view. Now, this view gives humans the freedom and the free will to choose our individual destinies and our eternal destinies, and it gets God off the hook for the evil deeds humans freely choose to commit. Now, that's the good news, but the bad news is that the simple foreknowledge view is maybe a little bit too simple because it also seems to relieve God of his providence and sovereignty. I mean, after all, if God simply foreknows the future, free actions of creature, of, of creatures, 
-hmm. how's he in any legitimate control of the future free action, uh, free actions of creatures? I mean, just knowing how somebody will freely choose doesn't give you any sovereignty or power over how they will freely choose. Right. And moreover, the Bible is clear that God is not only sovereign, but that he predestines not only the elect to heaven that we see in Galatians 1, 15, I believe, uh, but, but that God is provident over all things. We see this in Romans 8, 28 and Ephesians 1, 11, right? So if God predestines all things to happen, then how could the simple foreknowledge view of Arminianism be true? So there's your, there's your problem. We've got these two options here and neither of them really can satisfy, but perhaps the church has been caught on the horns of a false dilemma. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, contrary to popular opinion, there's another option out there, an option in the middle of these three two. Three party system. <laughs> That's right. At least a three party system. Um, there's an option in the middle and it splits the horns of the false Calvinism versus Arminianism dilemma. So, uh, so imagine this, this, you know, a bullfight, a bullfighting uh, in, in Spain or, or yeah, I mean, just imagine this bull with these two horns and you want to split the horns of this dilemma with a third option. And so it seems appropriate that a, a Spaniard <laughs> is the one who has split the horns of this beast. <laughs> uh, that is to say, this false dilemma has been defeated by a 16th century theologian from Spain named Luis de Molina. Now, the word Molinism, uh, it's derived from the last name of Luis de Molina. So you got Molina, Molinism. <laughs> um, doesn't have to do with dermatology. <laughs> right? But Molinism grounds God's <clears throat> sovereignty, not only in his omnipotence as divine determinists solely focus, but it also considers the full package deal. It also considers all of God's omni attributes. Now, in particular, it focuses on God's omnipotence and his omniscience. Now, namely, uh, Luis de Molina pointed out that since God is all powerful, right? The big fancy theological word for, or word for that is omnipotent, right? Since God is omnipotent and all powerful, then God has the ability, he's got the power to create many different possible uh, creations, right? He can create this way or he can create that way. We uh, Philosophers and theologians refer to this as possible worlds. And a good way to think about this, it's not a perfect analogy, but you know, for, your, for your viewers who are relatively new to this, if they've seen the Avengers um, Infinity War and Endgame, uh, Dr. Strange, uh, when he uses the time stone, he can see all these different possible futures. And then he uh, was able to see all these different possi possibilities, ways things could be. And he realizes that there's only one po possible world or possible future in which the good guys win and evil is defeated and, and Thanos is defeated. And so Dr. Strange does something to actualize that world. Now, it's, it's not a perfect analogy, so don't try to make it one. <laughs> But it helps you to start seeing things. If people want to go to my website. I, I love comic books and Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. But I really wrote about how the Avengers movies can help us understand Molinism, even if it's even if it's not a perfect analogy. Um, but but it can help you take steps to start connecting some theological and logical dots. But let me get back to these possible worlds. Um, God has the power to create many different possible worlds, including worlds with creatures like us uh, who he may or may not always causally determine. Uh, so that is to say that God has the power to create beings who possess what we call libertarian freedom. Um, God has the power uh, to create beings with libertarian freedom. He also has the power not to. In fact, God doesn't have to create any universe at all. He He's totally fine just existing as a trinity with nothing else. He doesn't have to create anything. He's perfectly content uh, in, in a perfect love relationship in, with the trinity. Um, however, 
if God was powerful enough to create different worlds, since he's also all-knowing, he's the, the big fancy theological word for that is omniscient. That just means that God knows the truth value to every statement that could be made. All right. So God, if that's the if, if that's the case, if God is omniscient, then God would perfectly know all that would happen in each of these potential worlds that are within God's power to create if God chose to create them. All right. So that's a mouthful. So let me a, that is a mouthful. I want to um, get this real quick. Yeah, and I've been rereading it or reading it. Um, everybody can see that. Um, oh, oh yeah, planning it. So get that book. I know it's it looks small. It's going to take you some time to get through. It's like reading a math book combined with a science and a philosophy book. Yeah. Um, and he does a great job. Obviously, he came up with the free will defense. Uh, that we might get into, but have explaining that, and I, I kind of thought this before, but the the best possible world idea um, that Mackie tried to use at, to kind of debunk the idea or existence of God, it doesn't logically follow, or at least that there's another option. And and in a defense, as opposed to a theodicy, you, all you have to do is show that there's another logical. Uh, possible option that that God could have done, and He does that well. So I think um, with that said, I want to I'm going to kind of slow walk us or slow walk all of us to the conclusion. So you you did a great job, obviously explaining what is uh, Molinism, and uh, I don't know what's going on here. Should I should I explain exactly what that middle knowledge? Yeah, I, have I talked about middle knowledge yet. Explain um, middle knowledge, and then yeah. I'll come back to this. Okay, so so basically, if God is omnipotent and omniscient, then so if God's omnipotent, He can create. He has options available. I mean, He's omnipotent. He's He's right. got omnipotential. Different things He could create. Different worlds He could create. He can create a world um, in which. Uh, humans don't exist. He can create a world in which, uh, you know, there's no matter. He can create, uh, he could only have created the angelic realms if he wanted to. I mean, there's so many different things he could do. He could create a world in which uh, I have hair. Uh, you know, he, he, he's yeah. all powerful, right? Um, but he, uh, he, he chose this world for some reason. Now, if God is omnipotent. He has the power to create all of these different worlds. If he's omniscient, he knows exactly what would happen in each of these possible worlds. So uh, let me uh, let me say it like this. God knows all that would happen in any possible world he could create. So this full view of God's omniscience includes what is referred to as middle knowledge. So the question is raised, okay, well, what is this kind of knowledge in the middle of so to that, we're going to get a little theological and philosophical here. So <clears throat> we've got, this, this is um, what we call the logical structure of God's knowledge. So what I like to say is imagine God as just a Trinity and he's never created anything. It's just God, no creation, All right? The vast majority of theologians, especially Christian theologians will affirm that there was a state of affairs in which God exists and nothing else does. And if your viewers are familiar with the Kalam cosmological argument, the Kalam does a great job of illustrating this cause of the universe just existing apart from uh, time and space uh, and anything in any creation. Right. So the Kalam does a great job. Have you ever discussed the Kalam with your. Not on this channel. Um, yeah, not yet. All right. Well, you can have me back on sometime. I can talk about that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's known as the Kalam cosmological argument. If anybody wants to do some research, uh, I've written a lot about it on uh, freethinkingministries.com and have a video on the uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, I think it's called The Big Bang or something now, like when that. When I go speak or you know, when we used to be able to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. The good old days. That was always what I would open with after I just explained truth. I would always talk about the 
we all agree, we Christian atheists agree that there was a beginning, you know? Right. So, and yeah. so that's where you can launch into that. Yeah. But yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah. Well, anyway, all that to say the Kalam helps us to understand this, but just, just imagine God and no creation. Now in that state of affairs where God exists and has not created anything, yeah. God possesses natural knowledge. That means he knows everything that he could do in that state. He also possesses middle knowledge. Um, that means he knows everything that would happen based on everything he could do, right? So God knows everything he could do and all that would happen if he did it. Then God creates. So, you know, I like to say big bang, boom, right? God mm -hmm. says, let there be light and bam, God creates a universe, mm -hmm. right? So he knows what's going to happen in this universe. And now he's got free knowledge. And that just simply means God knows what will happen. So the middle knowledge is in between God's natural knowledge and his free knowledge. Uh, God knows everything that could, would, and will happen. Now, like I said, you know, most Christians don't, if you're sitting out there trying to listen, you're like, I don't get this. I've never heard of anything like this. My pastor has definitely not ever talked about any of this. Hey, that's cool. Just hang with me. Uh, you, you know, most Christians are in the same boat as you. Most Christians have never heard of these terms before, all these different kinds of knowledge. But God's natural knowledge, like I said, simply refers to everything that he knows that he could create. Right? It's all potential situations within his power to make actual. Middle knowledge refers to the fact that God knows everything that would happen if he were to create a certain world within his power to create. And even if he never does, right? Even if he never does, he still knows what would have happened if he would have created it. And God's free knowledge means that God knows all that will happen in the world he's chosen to create. So again, for your viewers, that if this is if this is deep theological waters, go watch the Avengers and read my article about Doctor Strange and and the uh, and the Avengers, and things will start to come and uh, maybe uh, become clarified. But in a nutshell, if God is always omniscient then God perfectly knows all that could happen and all that will happen and also knows all that would have happened in different situations that he could have created. So that is to say that God knows all that could, would, and will happen and middle knowledge brings the would. So, uh, you know, that's that seems simple enough, <laughs> maybe, yeah. but the part that really confuses the layperson often is, that you know, it's vital to note that God's knowledge of what could and would happen is what we call logically before God's decree to create the universe. God's knowledge of what will happen, His foreknowledge, is uh, after His creative decree, if that makes sense. But so, yeah, that, that's that some a good words. segue into a couple couple terms, a couple big words we want to get into real quick. Um, and, and actually, even as we talk about the middle knowledge, one thing that when we talk about libertarian free will, and we'll get more into that, that helped me or um, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that knowing what a free creature would do or would choose between uh, two options doesn't mean you're making them choose it. That's right? exactly right. And that is yeah. where the freedom for me, <laughs> no pun intended, um, came and trying to wrestle between these these two potential, you know, Calvinism, Arminianism, because that makes the most logical sense. And not that it, if it makes sense to me, that's the right option. But then I look back back in scripture and I see, I see this affirmed actually. And even when I think um, an example I, I use sometimes with my younger audience, um, I, see, I still do a lot of youth ministry and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you ask my youngest daughter, if I say, hey, we're gonna get pizza tonight. I pretty much know which, which kind of pizza she's going to choose. Right. But I'm not making her choose it. That's right. And if we imagine an infinitely wise being as God is, he does know exactly what, you know, he's not guessing at it. And so that, yeah. that logic made sense and makes sense. And so now we're going to get into two big words that kind of dovetail off of what you just um, were highlighting.